Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? Let's continue our celebration of 400 YouTube videos. We're going to do something slightly different today. <coughs> Not coughing, that's I always cough. That's always that's just normal. Now I'm gonna to go to uh we're gonna have a little treat today. I'm gonna to show you something, an aspect of my life that I don't normally show on the channel. That might be a bit interesting to you. And uh see if you can guess. I'll try I'll try not to put a clue in the title so you'll have to have a guess. If you can't uh if you're not patient enough to wait then you'll have to fast forward and you'll be able to find out fairly easily but anyway I'm on my way somewhere I haven't got the uh, CCTV camera on because I don't uh, necessarily want the whole world to know where I'm going um, I don't you know I mean with the CCTV it's obviously it's fairly easy to work out where my house is um, because but I'm not too worried about that because that's on it's part of the public record you know that's like you know I'm a director of a company and you couldn't if you're registered addresses at your house then you have to accept that your house is in the public domain there's a massive hoo-ha at the GDC about 10 years ago about whether or not they should publish dentist addresses and uh, it was um, there were some very good arguments to publish dentist addresses because it was good to be able to look up at a, a name and then find out where they worked uh, for a variety of reasons you know if a patient came in and said oh, I used to see Mr. So-and-so uh, you know but I'm you know, where I don't bet you move somewhere but I don't know where or and they could uh, but the GDC said that they wanted all the correspondence to every dentist in the country to come through them if it was, you know, in, uh, if you didn't know their name, or rather if you didn't know their address, then then you had to write to the G, scare the GDC and then the GDC would pass the, the letter on. Although, whether or not they would pass it on, what's she doing? She's doing some sort of speed testing, I reckon. Whether or not, uh, you know, they, they, if you sent a letter and said, please pass on to Dr. So-and-so, I don't know whether they'd open it and, and read it and, and just check and see if it's a complaint or just pass it straight on. But um, the argument at the time was that, you know, it protected all the nurses because it's what some lecherous old patient, in theory, was supposed to be able to come in uh, and trace the nurse's registration and then find out their home address. This is this is a sort of a classic, you know, a risk mitigation of a risk that doesn't exist. There was, as far as I know, that never happened. Um, and the real purpose was to get the um, to interpose the GDC in between the communications between the you know the dentist and anyone who wanted to write to him. And I said that uh, at the time I argued that this was on the. Uh, GDP UK I think discussion forum that run by Tony Jacobs and uh, I said look you guys you know you're giving away too much power to the GDC here that basically you're going to be uh, allowing the GDC to use your address your, their address as your registered address in effect um, and you shouldn't do it you know you should, you should maintain your autonomy but I was pretty heavily uh, uh, outgunned on the forum by people who didn't really understand the argument I don't think they thought it was a it was a privacy issue and they decided that they wanted the privacy well but I, I objected to them choosing the GDC as the gatekeeper to that privacy they didn't quite understand the nuance of that argument and then what with you know what about the children what about the nurses argument it all went through um, and in fact to the to the extent that I was actually banned from the GDP UK discussion group which is you know was an early example of uh, censorship if you like where someone doesn't agree with your point of view and Tony Jacobs certainly didn't 
agree with my point of view, even though I had advertised on the site. We, the DPA used to advertise on the site, not, not that we ever got a single member from our advertising. It was completely useless as a plat advertising platform. But his brother, Jonathan, I think, did the advertising and sort of kept it in the family. And uh, he was very uh, protective of this uh, discussion site. And so he said, look, Derek, if you want to post anything, you're welcome to post it, but it's going to go like basically it's going to go in the waste bin unless I take it out and put it up. And uh, that you know, so, so they put me on like moderation, but everything I wrote had to be moderated. Well, the problem with moderation is that first of all, it is censorship, and secondly, you know, you can't respond in a timely fashion to anything because. It's all very well if I write something at nine o'clock in the morning and then Tony doesn't get a chance to check his email till five o'clock that night. And then, and also he's gonna get fed up with having to read everything I write, isn't he? So in the end, I just, you know, I tried it and it didn't work. So uh, I gave up posting stuff on the forum, which I don't care. I mean, you know, I don't mind being the voice of reason if people want to listen to it, but if they're, if they've, decided that they are going to form a bubble which is you know not really in accordance with your values then uh, what's the point of being a part of that group you know um, years later funnily enough I bumped into Tony Jacobs I think it was in the toilet or something and uh, he said to me you know <laughs> no you haven't posted on the forum lately I'm like, like no Tony that's because you banned me <laughs> and he said, oh, well, that's all, that's all water under the bridge now. He said, I'm sure that, you know, we could uh, sort that out, you know. And in that instant, I thought, right, okay, this, this group's not doing as well as it used to. You know, it's not the, uh, it's not the in thing anymore. He's obviously uh, realised, I think, the value of having some controversy. What's the point of posting on a discussion board? if you won't let anybody discuss anything. So as soon as it became like a self-reinforcing circle jerk of uh, practitioners, uh, the, the value deteriorated and so then and there he was asking me to come back on. But, you know, I politely said that it's, that was then and this is now, you know, I'm not going to do that anymore. So I don't, not interested in trying to explain things to people who not really capable of explaining them, you know. Ask, ask Satoshi Nakamoto when he was trying to explain Bitcoin when he invented it. You know, he said, oh, I don't have the time to explain this to you right now, you know. If you don't understand it, I'm sorry. I don't have the time to explain this to you right now. Uh, so, and then and I felt a bit like that, really. Anyway, I don't know how you feel about that. Perhaps it's worked and perhaps it hasn't. Uh, I mean, the other downside of it was that, um, you know, if you had a computer with the right software, you could make a query about every single dentist and basically download the dentist register. Um, and then you could email all the dentists. But that in practice, that didn't happen. You know, that really honestly didn't happen. Uh, I, as a dentist, I didn't get a load of junk mail from people who, who downloaded the, the dentist register from the GDC. And in fact, you're, in the past, the dentist register was printed as a book. You could buy it with all the dentists in it, this is before the nurses joined, all the dentists in it, all their home addresses, etc., etc. Uh, oh, well, I say some of them, obviously a lot of them used their practice address as, um, but anyway, addresses, addresses where you could contact them anyway. Addresses where you could get a phone number and ring them up and say, look, can I have a chat with Mr. So-and-so? I've got a patient of his. And then the other thing that was useful to us through the DDPA was being able to, if we uh, had a member and we posted them a magazine and the magazine came back, moved away or not at this address, then we could use the dentist register to just to update their address and repost the magazine. Now the idea that I'm going to ring up the GDC every time uh, somebody's magazine bounces 
and say, look, can I have an updated address? Because they won't give it to you. They'll just say, no, I'm sorry, we don't give out addresses. But if you want to write to him, care of us, then we will. And then and that's perhaps what we should have done. We should have just posted 3,000 copies of the GDP magazine out to the GDC uh, and just uh, addressed each one with the um, name and GDC number of the relevant dentists and let them let them forward them on, you know? But it's, it was, yeah, it's just another case of, as I say, <clears throat> uh, stupidity where the, uh, the, the dominant opinion wasn't really uh, based in reality. The reality of what's going on, you know, and as a result, and, and, and the censorship of any opposing views, um, and that was the end of it. So, but my address is, uh, as I say, I'm not, you know, I, I've had to resign to the fact that my address is in the public domain anyway. So, and I do, honestly, I believe that for the most part, people are not malignant. They are not, uh, you know, they're not going to turn up on my doorstep and murder me in between getting out of the car and getting in the house. Uh, I mean, possibly because, you know, although I make people mad, I don't actually make them mad enough to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> By which I mean, they probably want to kill me, but you know, it's that final step of actually organising it, you know, buying the axe that they, they balk at. Uh, and the other thing, you know, and as I say, that you're, you're. I don't think for the most part people are. They work like that, you know. I'm not saying there's nobody in the world that's a psychopath that won't stalk someone or. Uh, or wish them harm, you know. But I am not. I'm determined not to let myself get too uh, uh, paranoid about that sort of thing. Although I am, if you're in the public domain, then that's where you are. You're in the public domain. That you have to accept that. It's very difficult to stay completely private and still do anything effective in the public domain. So coming back to my original point, which is why I haven't got the CCTV on, is because uh, the webcam, the car cam, whatever, is because I don't really want to give away the location I'm driving to. And you'll see why when we get there. Uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, uh, it is a protected environment, and so I want to I want to keep it protected. All right. Anyway, uh, seeing as I'm going to do do. This might well be quite a long video because we're going to do a, a, bit, a few more bits on the end of this. I'll shut up now and I'll contact you when we're a bit closer to the destination. All right, bye. Right, well, we've arrived. Shall I turn the camera around and give you a little view round and then see if you can guess still, guess? Let's see if I can do that while I'm filming. Probably not. Okay, we'll have to stop and then turn it around. There we are, Ooh. and over that way, Ooh. nothing, all right, we'll carry on, this is the equipment that you need to do this activity, oh, a rucksack, and no, we are not going walking or climbing, have you guessed where we are yet, there's a clue, there's another big clue. And there's some hangars with some planes in. So, we're at an airfield and we're gonna go flying. And uh, first of all, I have to get inside there and tell them that I'm going flying. So let's see if I can find the key to Terminal 1. Strangely not locked. There we go. There's my signing in book. So let's get signed in. This is what do you think? Pretty bijou, isn't it? Pretty uh, well appointed. Tea and coffee. Mouse droppings. Junk room, 
toilet with uh, <laughs> vines growing through the floor. We don't use that one. We use this one, which is not much better. Anyway, let's uh, get signed in and I'll, uh, we'll get, get out of this place before I catch anything fatal. So, it's, quite, it's a nice day. It's cloudy. Let me show you the clouds. So, it's not like clear blue skies, but you don't necessarily need, let me just stay plot this a bit, you don't need clear blue skies necessarily to go flying. You need a reasonably high cloud base. Here where we are, we're about 400 feet up. So, uh, and the cloud's probably about 3,000 feet high, so I can easily squeeze in the gap. And we're gonna go flying to uh, a mystery destination. So <laughs> we're flying from a mystery destination to a mystery destination. Let's, let's go down and have a quick look at the runway and see what the state of the runway is. So I'm just walking out from the uh, apron onto the runway area. There's the old uh, windsock. So you can see the wind is coming pretty much straight towards me in my face which means from that end of the runway. That end of the runway's got some trees, so you have to make sure you're at tree height before you uh, lift off, if you take off that way. And then the other way. I know, I know it looks like it's got trees, but in fact there's just a hedge there, and the trees are a bit further down, so. Uh, as far as slope, there's not much of a slope. I think it slows slightly up towards that end. But I shall probably, let's have a look at the windsock. Probably, oh, I don't know. I'll probably decide when I taxi out which way I'm gonna go. The wind's pretty, uh, it does seem to be blowing this way slightly. I mean, the, the uh, that is important when you take off, obviously the wind, you take off into the wind. So you take off, if the, if the windsock is blowing towards you, you, you take off, up the small end of the windsock in a way you know you 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 taxi down the end of the runway it's pointing to and then you take off the other way there's but uh, when you take off as you climb up 100 feet 200 feet 300 feet then the wind will get stronger because there's less of a dampening effect with all the trees and everything so uh, a small headwind on the ground would translate into a big headwind after you take off so that's why you always uh, uh, always take off into the wind even if it's only a tiny tiny little headwind on the ground because it might be a larger headwind in the air and here we are here we are what I'll do is I'll this is my pride and joy I um, Right, I'll give you a few facts and figures. It's a rally aircraft, 180. It's 893E is this designation. It's a French aircraft, manufactured in the 70s. As you can see, low wing configuration, four seats, uh, capable of about six hours flight. So it's got decent uh, wing tanks on it, as you can see, and uh, I got my license uh, in about 1989 and flew in groups and for a long time and then uh, gave up flying for a bit and then started again. So uh, and finally managed to save up and buy my own aircraft. So for the terminally curious amongst you, it cost me £20,000 to buy. It's not, it's not very highly specified. I mean, it's maintained to on, on what they call a CAA permit, certificate of airworthiness, and so it's and that's to the same high standard that an airliner would be like a 737. So it has to go in for a service every six months or for every 50 hours flying, and it goes in for a full service every year. Um, you have to, in addition to the cost of the fuel and the insurance, you have to 
probably, well, I would say probably including the cost of the fuel and the insurance, you're probably looking at about £10,000 a year to fly something like that. Um, it doesn't belong to me, funnily enough, it belongs to my daughter, who's also a pilot. But she very kindly lets me fly it. And uh, today's a nice day. I've got the day off today. Got no patients coming in. So I thought, why not? So anyway, I'll, um, I'll do a little walk around and I'll take you through that and then perhaps I'll set the camera up. The, the problem with if you're doing people who do YouTube videos about flying, they've got GoPros everywhere. I haven't got a GoPro everywhere. I've got my phone and a selfie stick. So you're not gonna get, you're not gonna get the views that you would ex probably expect or want with a, with a, uh, from a, from a, you know, like a proper, properly produced YouTube video. But I'll do my best, and first of all, I'll just get the plane ready for flight. So I'll, I'll set it up in like slow motion and see if I can get a video of that. So that's got the uh, cover off and got it all opened up it's just a few more bits to do let's let's slide that back i'm going to put the backpack in the passenger side the uh, pilot always flies on the right on the left sorry it's on the, on the right in a helicopter and it's on the left in a plane so the next thing i have to do is take this red thing out. So let's see if I can do that one-handed. Let's put that away. This is the thing that locks it in place. So we'll pull that out. If I pull the thing forwards, then the control lock will fall out and then I have to slide it out of the pedal. So that's the control lock out and the screwdriver which acts as the which holds it in. So now these controls will move. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to turn on some of the control. So let's see if I can just put you down there. I don't know what you're gonna be able to see. Hopefully, you'll see I'm gonna turn on the master switch. Don't need to turn on the generator because the engine's not running. I'm gonna turn on the um, pito which warms up uh, the, it's a temperature uh, it's a um, speed a speedometer <laughs> it needs warming up and then I'm going to turn on the lights and then there's two more lights to turn on over here and then put the flaps down that's it so when I've done that now I'm ready for the outside check So it makes sense to uh, start doing the outside check from where you are. Well, it makes more sense actually to start doing it from there because that's where you get in. So let's have a look. You'll see these are the landing lights and those are the uh, navigation lights. We've got uh, strobes on this and we've got um, the red on the left and port, uh, red on the port and, and green on the starboard. So, why, why have we got, those? these are the flaps are down, so just want to have a quick look. And then we're going to look at things like, uh, this is the control rod for the, um, for the ailerons. Just want to make sure that's got a nut on it and the nut's got the locking pin in, etc, etc. And then, we'll have a little look underneath from this angle, just to make sure everything's fine. Yeah, it's all good. All fairly clean as well just cleaned it that's the hinge for the um, aileron so once again that's got the nut in got the locking pin in that's got the nut in got the locking pin in so the ailerons not likely to fall off but that's good always good then the end of the wing doesn't do much so the other um, Things we need to check from the front are 
There's various tubes and things on, we've got to check they're not blocked. Check that tube's not blocked. Then you check the wheel, it's got red marks on it. You have to check that the mark on the rim matches up with the mark on the wheel. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it hasn't, the, the um, tyre hasn't shifted round on the rim. If it did, then it might uh, sever the valve and uh, deflate suddenly. These are the tracks for the uh, flaps. And once again, we're just checking nuts on, looking, uh, cotter pins in, you know, uh, what are they called? Split pins are in. And altogether, it's looking pretty nice. The, we're checking the wing leading edge because this is the bit that generates all the lift. So you want to make sure that's nice and clean, especially the wing root, because when the propeller goes, the all the crap goes flying back onto this bit here. So we're okay so far. Looking for any missing nuts and bolts or loose nuts and bolts. Had a lot of trouble with that at one point. So propeller, again, looking at the leading edge of the propeller, is it clean? Is it bent? Uh, the cover does cover the engine, so I don't know if you can, let me see if I can get you to see inside there. There we are. In here, you're looking for things like bird's nests, uh, oil leaks. Certainly, you know, you can smell oil leaks most of the time. You don't really want to move the um, propeller too much because it's designed to operate even with the ignition turned off. So here with red marks, looking at uh, condition of the tyres, condition of the nose wheel, trailing arm. That's pretty clean because we did clean it up. As I say, you get a lot of flies and stuff stuck on that uh, nose leg. Here is the oil. So with oil, you're looking, oh my goodness. Hang on, I might have to put the camera down to get that open. Come on. There you go. That was tight. So it's a standard um, dipstick. It's measured in litres, being a French plane. So you can see there I've got somewhere between six and eight litres of uh, oil in there, which is about right. And you're looking to see whether it is it, does it look like oil? Does it look like black? Has it got bits of shiny metal in it, you know, indicating that the cylinders are self-destructing, etc. These clips you have to double check because if they get un undone like that, then what will happen is the air pressure will cause that to come up. So that's why they push down and twist lock so they, they won't come open. Uh, so same on the left hand side then. And uh, I'll meet you around the back. Now, that's the wire that works the uh, vertical stabiliser, or the tailplane, as it's sometimes called. It's, um, it's, this is a connector here, which is a nut, again, the castellated nut, with a split pin through it, and goes into this, so that, and I'll show you in a second, it swivels it. Uh, a lot of, I mean, on a plane like this, uh, you might say, well, that's, that's pretty, like, <laughs> it's just held together with, like, a coat hanger. Uh, in fact, that's not. It's very uh, robust system, and needs to be because this is a this is a hell of a tailplane. It's really big, and uh, catches the wind. And so, sometimes you really need to step on the tailplane to keep the plane straight. Especially because it doesn't have uh, power assisted steering. It's just literally got a castering nose wheel, as you saw, as a trailing arm castering nose wheel, and so. I'm often, I'm having to steer the plane with the engine and the tail and not the, uh, not the pedals. So that's the uh, link for the horizontal stabiliser. And that's, that's a minor, that's the actual link there. And then these two are adjusters, which I won't go into now because not, the purpose of this is not to give you a flying lesson. It's really just to get you in the air. That wire underneath there is um, the radio and uh, various other 
these antennas are for radio navigation and stuff like that. There's more. The more you look, the more you see. So anyway, I'm pretty happy with that uh, outside inspection. There's only one more thing we've got to check, and that's the fuel. So this is my uh, fuel gauge. What I do is I connect it under the wing, and then the fuel comes up the pipe, and then we measure it up against the side of the uh, plane to see how much fuel we've got. So let's let's see if I can show you that. Can you see the um, can you see the mark there on the side? There's two marks really, and each one of those is 20 liters. And the plane uses about uh, 38 litres an hour. So, let's get down and find the drain valve. And we pop that in the drain valve. And we hold that up and then open the drain valve. And that tells us how much we've got. So I'm waiting for it to settle down. It's still going up. It's going up. Going up. Right. Now you probably didn't see that, but that'll go up to about there. So basically, that means I've got enough fuel even in this, just in this one tank to uh, to do the trip I'm planning to do today. But that's 20 liters. That's 40 liters. So that's well over 40 liters. So that's well over, uh, let's say, an uh, uh, hour and a half flying. And I'm, I'm aiming to do two half an hour trips. So let's go around the other wing. There we go. I knew there would be quite a lot of fuel in here. So we don't need to fill up or anything, but um, you know, you hear stories of people having their fuel stolen and taken off thinking they've got full tanks when they haven't. Let's get, let's open that. So what are we up to? We're up to 40. Good. And again, that's about up there, so 20, 40, say, say 60, although you can't, that's not calibrated beyond 40, so I can't really say 60. I'll, uh, I'll show you where the fuel tanks are. This is them here. Let me just hold that without spilling any. So it's got two, it's got a lid, and then it's got a, a bung. So if I... Just put that in there. I'm just going to drain into there the uh, petrol that I've just siphoned off. Might as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So that goes in there. That goes in there. And we're ready to go. Just got to... Uh, Check if there's any water in the fuel tanks. I'll do that and then I'll come straight back to you. Right. Now, let's see about getting in. I was talking about this control lock. The reason why we put a control lock on is to um, stop it. The control surface is blowing about when it's windy. to get everything out of the way before I climb in. There we go. Do I need anything out of the back? No, I don't think I do. Well, do you know what? I might go across the Thames Estuary. So I think I'm going to uh, put my life vest on
it's one of those things that uh, it's difficult enough to put on <laughs> on dry land let alone if you're bobbing around upside down in the North Sea this uh, crotch strap is very important a lot of um, it's, it's fastened it's click click and fasten at both ends and so on a lot of life life coach will find that it's lost and uh, it's very important because when this inflates and blows up you'll um, want to make sure it doesn't just go up around your neck it's got to stay around your body and that's the crotch strap that does that so in we go with my immaculately polished derby shoes that I'm sure no other pilot flies with now I'm just going to start populating the uh, dashboard so we have a iPad mini that serves for the purposes of navigation this phone normally serves for the purposes of navigation I'm going to see if I can do without that and just stick with this what I've got is a iPad charging lead and I have a quite a beefy battery so I can plug that in there and that can go between the seats and then if I need to charge this up which I won't do on such a short trip then the other thing I've got is this Sky Echo this is a what they call an ADB which tells uh, air traffic control where I am it needs to be charged up every trip there it is so the first one is the uh, says the battery's okay the second one says that it's uh, transmitting and receiving on the ADSB and the third one is it's got a GPS lock and so it doesn't have a GPS lock at the moment so but that's fine by the time I take off it will have a GPS lock so we put that in there because that's where that goes good now I've got a checklist it's a very simple plane but uh, it is worth having a little checklist most pilots make these up themselves so I'm doing the start up part of the checklist so I check the controls are full and free which means that they work and that the uh, rudder works that the cabin ventilation and heater is off that's down there that's in case we have an engine fire on takeoff to make sure it doesn't come through into the cabin cockpit the parking brake is on well I'm going to just rest my feet on the tow brakes so that's fine then we want the battery on now before I before I power the plane up, I'm just going to say probably I'll try and do a little bit of footage taking off and landing or flying, but I'm not going to do it if it in the slightest it might endanger the flight. I haven't got camera points around the plane as I say, so I can't really uh, I can't really uh, promise you too much footage while I'm flying. Um, in which case I'll uh, meet you at the destination, but I'll, I'll show you the startup sequence and then we'll, we'll see how far we can get. So battery on, there we are, generator we check off, that's the generator failure light which we'd expect to see at this point. Then uh, we retract the flaps, we put them down didn't we during the take the uh, takeoff checks. Fly just blown in my nose. Then we put on the, um, the orange flashing light, the beacon on top of the plane, that tells people I'm about to start the propeller. Then we put the fuel selector off and the fuel pump on. So fuel, fuel pump on, fuel selector off, just to check that it, the warning light comes on to show that the fuel selector is off. Uh, we've got a, there's a, there's a two way uh, uh, valve down there, three way valve, the middle position is off and then, then you've got the two tanks. They don't mix automatically. I, I will have to, uh, I'll probably fly over there in one tank and come back on the other one. <coughs> Excuse me, we put the mixture ridge, which is like the choke, the carbier 
is cold and then we prime it and then uh, start start the engine so let me just get you inside and see if I can get you to stand up that might work it'll probably fall over when I start the engine anyway let's see what we go oh the other thing I've got to do is of course fasten up my harness so let's do that because I've put my life jacket on so I'm thinking I'm strapped in and of course I'm not oh dear come on that's it I think the thing about flying is you have to be a bit zen. Oh, this is not going to work. So I'm just going to, I'll just hold it and then do it all with one hand until, until I can't. And then I'll have to put you down. All right. So headphones on. Headphones on. Let's get the microphone adjusted. Now I'm going to... Close the canopy a bit. No, I'm not. I'm using a thing called Sky Demon. So I'm doing root, open, clip gate to collect and... Oh, I've given it away. I'll bleep that. And there we are. So that shows you the route we're going. I know it's a bit glary. Sorry about that. But we're going... We're going straight north, pretty much straight over, up over the estuary, and then straight down into Clacton, which is about the first thing that we, bit of land that we're going to see. All right. So what I do is I click go fly, and now what is happening is it's getting its data, position data from there, and that shows where we are. All right. So let's get started up. So the fuel pump is on, the beacon is on, the fuel's all ready to go through. I've got to pump this to get it going because it's a bit like uh, the old fashioned cars where you have to pump the choke to get the... Uh... Oh hello look there's somebody running over there, he's running away. They must have heard that we're um, going flying. I always keep the keys hanging up here because uh, I want to check that the keys are in the uh, are not in the ignition. So you keep them hanging up there so you can see that they're not in the ignition. So anyway, here we go. I might put you down for a bit because it would be dangerous to start this plane up one-handed. See, what you can see, you can see. Right, now, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm going to uh, put the generator on, turn the fuel pump on. Uh, pretty much everything else on. And then the other thing I have to do is turn on the comms. So that's it. The comms will come on. And that's where we are stand by. The, uh, that's a thing called the V uh, the VOR code. No,
software has realised that I've, uh, I've started moving and as soon as I take off it'll, it'll know from my speed that I'm flying so uh, that will start logging the hours on my flying. So I've just got to do a few checks now to make sure that the engine's running properly before I take off. Okay, checks complete. So uh, I'm going to take off. Well, uh, I'm not going to uh, hold the camera while I'm taking off, but I'll uh, see if I can do a little bit of filming as we go over the Thames Estuary. I'll see you in a bit. Right, good, excellent, here we are. Clacton, lovely little airfield. Big airfield really, do flight training and everything. And uh, got to go and pay the landing fee now. It's about 15 pounds I think, which is not bad considering the amount of diesel they must spend mowing this lot. And uh, I'll uh, talk to you in a bit when I've uh, done, the, uh, done the admin. I've just got to shut the plane down, so what we do is just go through it. That's the flap indicator, so the flaps are up. That's the fuel tank, I'm still on the right tank, use that all the way over. That's the flap lever. Then we've got on the right the mixture which I just used to cut the engine. The throttle which is like the uh, throttle. <laughs> the carb heat which is um, you use to put hot air through the carburetor at high altitudes and uh, high, high um, well more to do with high um, relative humidities, stop the carburetor icing up. 
Then you've got all the gauges, fuel gauge, oil pressure gauge, uh, ammeter, whether it's charging up or not. Then here we've got the, uh, as I say, the squawk, uh, which allows air traffic control to see you. Then above that, we've got the radios we were using. Then, then on the right, the ADSB, which I've just turned off. There's all the fuses down there. Never had one of those pop out, fortunately. And then all the instruments, which I mean, you can get off of any standard. Um, uh, just do a quick Google search. And then what I'm going to do is now turn the uh, turn the ignition off and hang the keys up here so that, as I say, everyone can see that the keys aren't in the ignition. Then we uh, log, log the engine off and go back to planning. And then that automatically records the flight for me. Takeoff time, landing time, off blocks, which is when you start moving, on blocks, which is when you stop moving, um, and uh, date and uh, flying time and everything for my logbook. So I'll just turn the uh, generator off and you run your finger along the bottom there just to check they're all in the same position because they're all, they're all off. Uh, in a plane, up is on and uh, down is off. So it all seems to be fairly, um, all fairly good. So I'll pack up and put my yellow what's it on and uh, I'll see you in a minute. Right, let's close the lid. It's probably not worth locking it up, but I will anyway. There we go. Now I've got to get down by that tiny step, making sure not to step on anything that's white. There we are at Clacton. So, that's the flying school over there. That's a Piper Cherokee, very nice plane. Go none, go none. Don't know what that is. Anyway, I'll turn the camera off until the we're in public. Oh no, this is quasi public space. There's no there's no implied right to privacy in an airfield, but I will uh, I will turn it off. That's where you look for the little the yellow C. The yellow uh, square with a C inside. Right, let's talk to you in a minute. So they've got a nice little area here for viewing, you know. If you want to, they've got a cafe in there if you want a cup of tea. I mean, to be honest with you, there's hardly ever anybody here. It's a, it's a very quiet airfield. I'll put my bag on the back and then we'll go into town.